Welcome everyone. Today I'm with Dr. Claire Higgins, PhD, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial College London. Um, welcome, Claire. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of background uh, on your work uh, to date and why it's important in the hair loss field. Um, Hi, Nilifa. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Um, so as you said, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Bioengineering and my lab works on um, skin regeneration. Actually, the name of the lab is the Skin Regeneration Laboratory. But I have always been interested in hair. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Durham, which is in the north of England, um, researching hair shedding and hair neogenesis with um, Professor Colin Yehoda, who's a pioneer and um, in the field of hair regeneration, and I'm sure a name that many of your um, viewers will know. And then after my PhD, I moved to the Department of Dermatology at Columbia University in New York, and I also studied um, hair regeneration and hair cycling there. And I also looked at a number of um, genetic diseases that influence things like hair length. So I've always been interested in hair. And then when I started my own lab in 2013, it um, was very natural for me to use the hair and skin as a model system. Yeah, so um, that that's wonderful. And, you know, you've got great background knowledge. Um, and people, patients in particular, um, ask us, well, you know, when is cloning, when are you going to regenerate hair? Because patients are coming to us for either medical treatment or for hair transplantation. And, you know, we have to explain to them that it's a genetic condition that's ongoing for the rest of their life. And they say, well, why can I get this one-off fix? Why can't you regenerate new hairs? And it is 50 to 60 years since it was first proven that it could be done. So why isn't it available yet? Well, I think the fields needs to catch up with one another. So hair research has been around for um, more than 100 years. Um, uh, people were researching rat whisker growth back in the early kind of 1900s. But the field of tissue engineering is actually only around 25, 30 years old. Um, it's, it's still coming about and to really achieve hair regeneration or hair cloning, um, we need to utilize and exploit the field of tissue engineering because um, essentially we want to engineer a new hair follicle. So there's three main components of tissue engineering. Um, there's cells, signals and scaffolds and all three of these components need to be optimized um, and come together for us to really achieve organ regeneration. And in the hair research field, most of the work has been focusing on the cells which initiate hair cloning or hair induction. Um, and very little effort has to date been put into looking at the scaffolds or the signals involved in hair cloning. Um, and that's starting to happen now um, that we have more understanding of this field of tissue engineering. Um, but we're, we're still catching up. So the hair field is actually quite far ahead of us. Um, so rodent cells were first uh, used in hair cloning, as you say, about 60 years ago. And then in the 1980s, um, Jehoda and colleagues showed that you could take these rodent cells out of the hair follicle and expand them in number in culture, and they still retained their capacity to instruct new hair growth. Um, in the 1990s, it was shown that human dermal cells could also instruct hair growth. And I think the lag there was that human systems just weren't really, or human tissue was not really used very much in research back then. And so that was the only reason there wasn't, was a delay. It wasn't because of lack of expertise or anything like that. And then the real uh, delay then came in showing in showing that cultured human cells were ca capable of instructing new hair growth. And that was finally achieved in 2013. Um, and 
it was I feel like I'm going around in circles a bit um no, that's all right um that was finally achieved in 2013 and I think that was because these three pillars were actually taken into account so cells were grown in a different conformation in culture that recreated the kind of native architecture that we would see in the intact dermal papilla. So that's the scaffold component of this tissue engineering um, kind of triangle cell signals and scaffolds. And it was bringing in that extra pillar that enabled that next step to be made. So, so in other words, it's not really a matter of just taking out cells and then growing them in the lab and then sticking them back in the head. It's kind of building a new house per se. So you, you, you've got all the components and you've got to build that new house or build that new hair follicle. Um, and you've got to get all those components. And, and you mentioned the fact that there was lack of, um, of human tissue. And um, certainly, you know, over the last 20 years, because of, our, of my own personal interest in, in hair biology, um, I've been involved with labs like your own uh, on different hair projects. And I think, um, you know, I really do have to thank uh, our countless patients over the years who've given, you know, a few hair follicles that were transected. We can transplant them, a little bit of skin, uh, a little bit of fat that goes with it. And, and patients really are very, very interested in getting involved in research. And, and we do explain to them that um, what the research is that's going on now may not benefit them. But even so, patients are really, really kind of invested in hair loss and, and hair biology and wanting to find um, cures, um, maybe not for themselves. But you know, for their sons, their you know, their future generations, uh, and we've been really very grateful and happy to to work with labs such as yourself. And um, but one thing that that um, I really wanted to to ask about is that a lot of people are um, on the internet or in their advertising, they're saying stem cell therapy. Now, does stem cell therapy actually exist or it and and if it is is it what we think it is or is it something else you know if you put in stem cells that's not quite the same as putting in something that's going to stimulate a new hair follicle surely um so all tissues have stem cells in them um which are required for a, a tissue to be maintained and i think a lot of people don't realize that so when you harvest something like fat, um, they do have adipose derived stem cells within them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of people then think, oh, it's a stem cell therapy. It, it's going to cure everything. Um, so all cell therapies um, work via a particular mode of action. And a stem cell is designated as a stem cell because it has two characteristics. One, it can self-renew, and secondly, it can differentiate into multiple cell types. And I think a lot of people assume that if you have stem cells injected, those stem cells will then differentiate into hair follicle cells and your hair follicles will get bigger. Um, but that is not the mode of action of adipose-derived stem cells in the context of hair loss. Um, we think that um, any cells that are injected, such as adipose-derived stem cells, act via paracrine effect. So they just release factors that maybe um, prolong the growth phase of the hair follicle um, or, or prevent it from moving into a regression state. But they don't actively contribute to the follicle and make the follicle bigger. So the source of cells that you inject is really important. Um, so you have is to think this about the signal they're as... producing and if they can actively contribute to the follicle or not? Yeah. So sorry to interrupt there. So um, is this the sort of signaling effect that we also potentially are getting from treatments such as platelet-rich plasma, so PRP? 
And when the platelets degraded, it releases certain growth factors. So what you're talking about in terms of a paracrine signal is not the same as those growth factors, but is a, a similar idea that you have a signal that's sent out that then um, affects the hair follicle? Absolutely, yeah. And I think in androgenetic alopecia, hair miniaturizes not because the growth phase of the follicle is affected, but all hair cycles, so it actively grows during the anagen phase, then it moves into a regression phase and then moves back into the anagen phase again. And actually miniaturization tends to occur during the transition between these phases rather than um, because there is a defect in the growth phase. And so PRP or adipose derived stem cells might release um, growth factors that can prolong the growth phase and stop the follicle cycling. And in stopping the follicle from cycling, they're potentially delaying miniaturization, but they will not act to um, enlarge the follicle or reverse miniaturization. So it's also which phase of the hair follicle that they're working on, mm -hmm. um, which is quite important. But yeah, they, they release signals. So again, it's one of the three uh, pillars of, of tissue engineering, um, which is coming into play there. So the other thing that um, people ask about as well is, is the genetics of hair loss. So there's a lot of things involved in genetics. So there's the original genes that you have, then you have switching on and off genes, then you have multiple genes that interact uh, possibly with each other, and then you have um, what we term epigenetics, uh, you have outside influences, you have things like, um, you know, uh, release of, of toxic chemicals, uh, in, the, in the body, and you have aging that changes the genetic pattern. So I think it's really a very, very complicated kind of system that we're looking at. And, and I know that recently you've been looking at some of the genetic components of what, what's happening in the hair follicle. Can you maybe just discuss that uh, briefly? Um, yeah, we've been looking at the genetic components and also some of the epigenetic components, um, which are thought to be affected by as you say, things like aging and also the external environment. Um, but all cells in your body, in the hair follicle, outside the hair follicle, express this, have the same DNA within them. So they all have the capacity to express any gene. It's whether or not that gene is turned on or off, which um, affects how that cell behaves. Um, and it's not just things intrinsic to cells which determine whether a gene will be switched on or off, um, but external factors. So for example, um, the adipose derived stem cells or the PRP could release a signal that binds to a receptor on a cell within the hair follicle, and that can lead to a gene in the hair follicle being switched on that might then affect things like hair follicle cycling or the, the length of the growth phase. Great. So as a final question, uh, again, something that patients ask is, will there ever be a cure for hair loss? And we're talking about genetic hair loss or common balding. Um, I think so. Yes, I, I am ever an optimist, but a lot of work now is being done using human samples. And as you said, um, using human samples absolutely is a, is a game changer. Um, in terms of male pattern hair loss, there's no animal model to study male pattern hair loss. And so having access to um, miniaturizing samples from patients who have genetic forms of hair loss has really enabled research to, to move forward. There's actually a lot of differences between um, rodents and, and mice in terms of the, the cells within the follicle, in terms of the signals those cells are producing, um, even the age of follicles that are used in rodent studies are completely different than human studies. So most mice or rats are a month old when their follicles are isolated for research studies. Um, humans are 40 or 50 years old and 
we see huge differences. Um, but if we can use human samples, um, yeah, then I think we will get to the root cause of, of this. Great. So um, I'd, I'd like to leave things here because, I mean, I can talk all day with you about this topic because it, it's something that, you know, it really, really fascinates me. But a message that I want out to any hair transplant surgeons who are listening to this uh, video or even patients who are going to their doctors, please, you know, get involved with the researchers. Find out where there's a, a lack. We are lucky enough that there are uh, a number of really high profile hair biology research labs around the world, which I find really very unusual, uh, very um, encouraging because, you know, what we want is we want to get to that cure. It might put me out of business, but, you know, I've got a son who's losing hair and my husband's bald. So I, I'm in it for I'm in it for that reason. So I want to thank uh, Claire for joining us today, and I hope everyone has en enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm.